here. I've got a couple of regal moths here that uh, live in the eastern United States. These are captive raised. Um, they're very beautiful. Uh, I've, I have never got one. I've been collecting all my life, and this, this is the first pair that, uh, that I've gotten. So these were pinned up a while ago, and they're all dry now. So I'm going to pull the pins out, and, um, and I'm going to show you a technique. Uh, the male here especially has some grease in the abdomen. When these things uh, hatch out of their cocoon, they, they only live for a few days. They just live on the stored energy and water that they, they got as a caterpillar in their tissues. So uh, they store some fat in their body. And um, when they die, if they haven't flown around a lot, burned up that energy, uh, the fat cells sometimes break down and, and stain the sides of the abdomen. So I'm going to show you how to deal with that. But first, we're going to pull the, uh, pull the pins out. Okay, so this one is the female. Now I broke her antenna off while I was pulling those pins um, because I was distracted. The female looks pretty good. You can see the abdomen looks pretty nice and clean. I think there's a little stain on this side. Yeah. I don't know. I don't think I might not do anything to this one. You can see it's uh, stained right there. This side looks pretty good. They're a beautiful moth. Really very nice. There's a southwestern species that I have collected in Arizona that's also very beautiful. This one's got a lot more kind of that orange-red. That's really a nice moth. One of the prettiest moths we have in North America. So I'll have to uh, glue that antenna back on. Let's pull. This one has a broken antenna when I got it. It's probably a little cheaper that way. It's got a few scratches, but very nice. But you can see the abdomen is really badly discolored on both sides. So when this happens, there is a way to treat it. Uh, if we soak this in acetone, it will remove the staining, It'll dissolve the fat out. Uh, the only problem is these moths have a lot of fur on their thorax, on their body, and it's uh, organized in a way. There's little tufts. Uh, if you soak this whole moth in acetone, it can mat this fur. Uh, which you could fluff up again later, but it's like I almost rather not do that. The, the thorax is in good shape. There's no fat coming out of it. It's just the abdomen. So I'm going to remove the abdomen and then soak it in acetone. I've got a jar of uh, acetone here. So I'm going to use a, a sharp X-Acto knife. And I'm going to hold the moth upside down and I'm going to make an incision on the underside right where the abdomen joins the thorax on both sides. There's a weak point there where I should be able to get through and get the abdomen to come off without damaging it. And then once the acetone has soaked the fat out, I can reattach it with some glue. And I'm going to grab the tip, bend it backwards. There it comes. Yeah, it's going to work just fine. It's got a little piece joining there yet. Uh, sometimes these larger moths, when they're shipped as specimens, they remove the abdomen and ship it separately uh, and soak it in acetone ahead of time so that it doesn't stain the wings. I'm going to put this moth back down can really see the staining on that. It's really pretty bad. I'll take my little jar of acetone. The acetone will mat the fur somewhat on the abdomen, but the fur on the abdomen lays pretty flat anyway, so it'll be less noticeable. So I'm just going to plunk this in here and uh, let that soak for a while. It depends on how much fat is in it as little as a couple of hours, as much as maybe a couple of days. Um, you can pull it out and, and check on it and see how it's doing. Now remember acetone is very flammable and the fumes are toxic, so minimize your exposure to that. All 
Now, retaching an antenna is useful, a skill to have. It happens pretty regularly. They break off, so I'm going to put them off nice and straight in the slot there. I need a couple of small pins as props. And then I'm going to use a small pin to place the glue. Again, we're using a blue gel, water soluble blue gel. And get a little bit of glue on the tip of the pin. And uh, I'm going to put this on the little uh, stub where the antenna was attached on the head and tap it onto there so that it's really coated with glue. That'll help the antenna stick. These antennas are very fragile, so when you pick them up with the tweezers, you can easily break them. So we handle them as little as possible and as gently as possible. I'm going to place a pin to kind of support that antenna before I even uh, attach it, just so it has a place to go. I'm going to get another little drop of glue on this pin to coat the tip of the antenna with. I'm going to hold that in my left hand and grasp the antenna so that it's oriented in the correct way. And again, these are very fragile, so I want to be really gentle with this. Now I'm going to dip the tip of the antenna in the glue. So when that touches the base that already has the glue on it, it should stick real quickly. There. And it takes a few minutes for that to dry, so we have a little time to position it. And you can use pins to brace the antenna so that it lines up with the other one. there. Looks pretty good. So we'll let that dry. One of the legs broke off of this moth, and that's not that unusual. Here's the broken leg. Uh, but I like to keep them intact as much as possible. So I'm going to put a little glue right here where it, the leg goes. And it's just as simple as laying this leg into place. There's a little slot should fit right there. And as long as we're working on these regal moths, I've got another really beautiful moth to show you. This is a South American Saturnid moth, a little smaller, kind of a medium-sized one. And this is called uh, Pseudodurfia menander. This one is uh, much less common in the hobby. I've only seen a couple of them, uh, and only in the last couple of years have they become available. Often these species are from particular areas, or they're just not uh, around the areas where people commonly collect, so they're difficult to come by. A lot of interest in these Saturnid moths, so over time uh, they eventually start breeding them and then become common. This one's really pretty, though. Very different from any of the other uh, Saturnid moths. The color combination is really unique. I believe there are a couple of subspecies in this genus that look similar. Look at that. The forewing is this nice kind of rosy red, and then the hindwing is a contrasting gray with a nice little white stripe in it. It's really quite nice. There are so many thousands and thousands of these different species of Saturnid moths. I think you could collect your whole life several lifetimes in a row and uh, never see them all. Here we go. The abdomen's got a nice orange striping on it, too. Yeah. Isn't that pretty? 
And I've also got a little rosy maple moth. These are very common species in the uh, eastern United States. And I live in the western United States, in Washington State, so these are not found here. I've been trying to get one for a while. I have a couple of old ones in my collection, but the color tends to fade pretty badly on these. Uh, this one was also uh, greasy. Uh, the abdomen was stained, and so I gave it an acetone soak, and this one came out really quite well. They're small, but they're very pretty. Kind of pink and, and uh, gold, yellow gold on them. This uh, abdomen has been soaking in acetone for a couple of days now. Uh, you can see how the liquid is discolored a little bit. It's the fats coming out into the solvent. I'm going to dry it out now. So I'm some paper towel here to absorb the acetone. Now, I can't see any of the dark staining that was on this before, so I'm just going to set it there and let it uh, dry out. The acetone's really volatile, so it should dry out very quickly, just within a few minutes. This uh, abdomen is dried now, and the staining is gone. It's, it's nice and clear, both sides. So this worked really, really well. The hairs are a little bit matted, so I have a, a fine little paintbrush. And what I'm going to do, these hairs will come loose if you jar them very much, so I'm just going to very gently touch the brush to the hairs to loosen them up a little bit. And you have to do this very gently because you'll knock the hairs loose. I've also uh, heard of this being done with um, uh, a canister of compressed air that you would use to maybe blow dust out of an electronics. And I've tried that, but it's so strong, it doesn't, I don't know the technique for that. But this is what I've done, and it seems to work pretty well. It just fluffs them up a little bit, so it has a more natural look. Yeah, I think that turned out really well. To the sides a little bit, too. It's a dramatic improvement over that blackened, greasy, stained abdomen that was there. There, that looks pretty good. Now I can reattach it to the uh, to the moth. And we can see that that really dramatically improved the appearance of it. Yeah. So I'll get some glue and uh, apply some to. to the body of the moth, right around the center bit, and then pin that in place so it's in a good position. And then I'll add a little glue to the uh, edges of the body of the moth. I always find if I put glue on both surfaces, it's much better, it sticks a lot better. There. Now I can just put this abdomen into the correct position. And I can use a couple of pins to support this abdomen so that it is nice and straight and not drooping. Just 
tilt it a little bit to one side. Yeah. That looks just fine and it's nice and straight. And we'll just let that dry. The abdomen has dried now and it uh, came out pretty good. It's no staining on it. It's a little bit uh, ruffled there, but um, still quite a nice specimen. Will certainly do. Now, I pulled out a couple of other specimens of the same genus, Citheronia. These are both from Brazil. These are old uh, specimens, 20 years old and um, wild caught, I'm pretty sure, so they're pretty beat up, but still, they're good examples, I mean, of the specimens. And I noticed that this one has a crack in the wing. Or is it this one? Yeah, this one has a crack in the wing. Let's see if you can see it right there. And uh, a friend of mine, Stephen Mayerson, showed me a technique for repairing a crack in the wing. So uh, what I'm going to do is I'm going to use um, some of this uh, Elmer's Blue Gel. I don't know if it's Elmer's, but clear blue gel glue and put a little dollop in there. And then I'm going to add just a little bit of water to thin it out, just a drop, and uh, mix it up. Okay, and then I'm going to use uh, a pin, an insect pin, maybe like a number three, and it has a little ball on the end. You can see that little ball. And I'm going to use that as an applicator and get some of the glue on the head of this pin. Just a little bit of it. And then holding the moth upside down, I start at the base of the crack, where the crack first appears in the wing, and apply the glue to it and then stroke it along the crack. And what this does is it applies a thin layer of this glue right along the crack and it just sews both sides of the crack together with glue. A little bit more on the end. And this just works really, really well. You'll see a little bit of glue on the bottom, but that's okay and it will definitely protect the wing from further damage. There. And once that dries, it'll be um, good and solid. I think there was a crack over here too. Yes, there's one on the other side too. So I'll do it over here as well. Let's see where the crack is. Oh, there it is. Yeah, there's another little crack too. And this certainly stabilizes, uh, you know, you have an older specimen or even just a valuable one that's damaged. This is a way to stabilize it so the crack doesn't get any worse. Maybe a little bit on this wing tip here, too. Yeah. There. These are the finished specimens, the male above and the female below. And you can see that the abdomens came out really nice. I ended up uh, soaking the female's abdomen in acetone too. Why not? Um, so those are the regalis from the eastern U.S. and this is the uh, southwestern species, uh, Splendens, Citheronia splendens sinaloensis, uh, referring to the state of Sinaloa in Mexico. And uh, I, I love the contrast uh, patterns here between the gray and the bright white. Uh, it really is pretty striking. I had I didn't have these regalis in the past, and I always thought of them as being really beautiful, and they are. But um, I really think I, I like the Arizona one the best. It's really striking. And then these are the uh, South American varieties. There's about 35 that I know of in this genus, uh, all very similar, obviously closely related, descended from some common ancestors. You can see the spot patterns um, are similar 
in all of them, just different variations on them. Uh, but very, very nice looking moths. The caterpillars of all of these are really huge, uh, six inches long. Uh, here's a photograph of the um, southwestern one. I see these often down there feeding on wild cotton. The regalis caterpillars are the same, only different color scheme, more green, whereas these are more kind of purpley, pinkish. I'm not sure. uh, this is the female of the splendens, uh, larger than the male, and also a really beautiful moth. And here is the pupa. Uh, it's really quite, quite big. These moths do not spin cocoons. The larvae burrow into the soil, make a cell space in the soil and they pupate there. Uh, so they're kind of unusual in that way. There's a couple other species of moths that don't spin cocoons. Now that I've gotten this female splendens out, uh, I've noticed something. Look how tiny the antennae are. See how slender they are? And the male antennae are larger. So I thought this was a female of the regalis, but actually it's just a larger male. The females are always larger. And uh, I purchased this as a pair. Uh, but it's clearly not. Look, the antennas are the same as on the males. Yes, look how thin the females' antenna are. And this is because the females emerge from their pupa and uh, they just release a pheromone, like a perfume, that wafts on the wind. And the males use their larger antenna to detect those molecules of the pheromone and to fly and find the females. So the males' antennae are more feather-like.